Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, you can join the YouTube channel directly to support us at even $1 a month. I've seen a couple of you doing that recently. Shout out to you. Or hit us up at patreon.com slash Aksum. Our special guest today is now aka Saint Yared. And I was recently at one of my favorite Habesha events I've ever been to in uh, LA that you and our mutual friend Dick Anesh hosted. It was with uh, Hollywood is Habesha and the Habesha Film Association. Could you introduce yourself to my audience and, and maybe talk about those organizations? Definitely, definitely. Uh, so I just want to say thank you again for having a, having us, uh, having me on the studio on your podcast. Um, so Hollywood is Habesha. Uh, the short of it is um, through St. Yared, as you mentioned, uh, my design studio. Uh, put out a t-shirt that said uh, Hollywood is Habesha on the back. The reason that I put that there was because uh, I thought that it was a provocative statement and uh, just positioning my brand and my work uh, towards, uh, you know, towards the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was something that needed to be said because there were a lot of Habeshas that had already entered the Hollywood space. Yes. From several different angles at this point, you know, from, Music, you know, we're in the post the weekend kind of era, Mine, uh, Nipsey Hustle, right? To uh, television, you know, Marcus Samuelson and Leah Cabetta and, um, you know, lo lots of other people, Tiffany Haddish, um, lots of other people. Um, and so we put that shirt out, and Dinkinish, our mutual friend, was just so into the shirt and wanted to make an event from it. And wow. Yeah, so we decided to put an event together and we wanted to address some of the uh, different topics that we felt uh, were like uh, very relevant to the industry, uh, the entertainment industry community, professional community um, regarding uh, Ethiopians and air trans. So we started to put together, um, loosely put together conversations and that kind of evolved into now it's become an event series where we focus on um, uh, different disciplines within the entertainment industry. And so the first one uh, that you came to, which would be our second installment okay, in collaboration with, uh, uh, with the Habesha Film Association. And so uh, Habesha Film Association is run by, I think, co-founded co by four individuals. Um, I think three of them are now uh, in Ethiopia as we wow. speak, and one of them, uh, Doug Maui, is uh, running the LA chapter. Uh, he's here in LA, LA. He's running it from LA, and um, we had the pleasure of collaborating with him to put that, put together that event and really sit down and and uh, you know get a, a really good group of of Habeshas in the industry who are um, <clears throat> coming up. They're kind of coming up in the industry and they all have different uh, roles, right? There was, a, we tried to um, get a, a nice mix of folks, you know, from the journalism end to um, production, to being in front of the camera um, and even working, you know, uh, on film and television, even from, um, uh, a music lens. There was some overlap there, some of the panelists. So, absolutely, and career starters and people deep in their career. Yeah, uh, exactly. yeah. <laughs> so that was that was impressive and and dope. So that's a very interesting. You talk about how you're wearing like these couple different hats there. How how different is kind of event planning from design? I imagine design is your your first love. Can you talk a little bit about? you know, how you got into design? Like, I don't know, were you a kid just designing things? Um, and then kind of segue that into like, like that different world. Cause I think not everybody is built to be wearing uh, multiple hats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, um, it takes a certain type of head to wear multiple hats. You know, I say that because I think a, a large part of it is also building your mind, building, building your, you know, I'm constantly reading about leadership and that kind of stuff. So, but um, to answer your question, uh, I was trained in design. Uh, was trained in design um, 
Uh, I went to college for uh, design. I studied uh, museum. I studied museum and galleries stuff. I studied uh, cur curating, and I also studied uh, interior design. And then later on, when I got into the working world, I was working in architecture. So I bounced between architecture and um, uh, galleries and museums. Okay. So when I first came out here, I had more of a curatorial background in terms of my working experience. Now, when it comes to event planning, there's actually a lot of overlap between curating and planning. Yes. A lot of coordination, a lot of different personality types, and uh, you know, there's exhibition design. So that's where the interior design has that crossover into that space. And when you think about events, you have to be cognizant of you know the space. You know, how are you going to fill the space? How are you going to use the space? And, uh, you know, I tried to use those principles. A lot of that, those transferable skills, I use those principles. So what are we using the space for? What is the, the conversation we're trying to have? Now, with Hollywood as Habesha, I think the thing that really stands, really separates us from any other lecture that I've seen, I think Dinkanish can agree, but I'll let her speak on that, is that we want to encourage folks in the community to come forward and be a part of the conversation. Yes. Right? Well, I was really changed by the Clubhouse app when it was okay. very bad, right? We met on there. We met on there with our met. other mutual friend, Addis. Addis. By the <laughs> way, Addis has been on the program too. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so you're in good company. You know, I, all li all roads kind of lead back to Addis Daniel in LA. That's funny. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, her and I grew up together in, in LA. Our moms were pregnant at the same time. She's a couple months older than me. Oh, wow. Yeah. 1990, yeah. huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, you just yeah. put her on blast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I always, I always tease her about that. Yeah. But, um, but you know, I, lo I love, I love you guys. Shout out to 08. But, um, <laughs> but, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, so there's overlap there, you know, and, um, from Clubhouse. But yeah, there's overlap there. And I think that we were really trying to figure out how to keep that conversation communal, which is yeah. why to adopt the whole Mahabur kind of, we're kind of fusing Mahabur and clubhouse structure together. So we want to keep it free. We want to keep it, uh, you know, um, low maintenance in terms of setup and in terms of uh, the way the way that the uh, everybody in the room can network without really hierarchy um and just yeah keep it very democratic as democratic as possible yeah that was really fascinating that you brought up the technology piece because it shows that we could have this conversation on so many different layers especially now that you see the competitor i was i was big into clubhouse when it first happened too i kind of fell off at a point but that's mostly because the emergence of Twitter spaces, which had the basically alternative. And um, I am many things, podcaster, all these things, but at my core, I kind of think of myself mainly as a writer or maybe like, I wish people would respect me most for that or something, I don't know. So the, the, the medium of Twitter is something that I like a lot. And so the fact that it was already connected to my pre-existing kind of uh, audience that I had built as opposed to starting from scratch again, which could be a little demoralizing. You do it again. Like I just hopped on TikTok recently, which I told myself I was never going to do, but now I know, you know, the people are there and I couldn't deny it anymore. So I'm, I'm wondering what you think of how you saw moderators moderating either differently or the same in the, in clubhouse when you, when you first kind of got onto it. And I wonder what you kind of uh, took away from that. And if you've ever dabbled with uh, Twitter spaces. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely familiar with Twitter spaces. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of navigating that, but as far as clubhouse goes, I definitely was on there. Like you said, we met on there. So that was what, uh, top of 21 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, um, yeah, you mentioned it died down, it, which it did. And, um, I have actually been still been going on there and That's still good. participating. Like I would say even as recently as this month. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason is because I found that yes a lot of people did disappear um you know it's just kind of like anything when you give people the tools it's up to them what they want to use it for you know right. and uh, i still think that clubhouse is a, is a powerful tool and i'm i actually want to make the argument that that i think it's actually more uh powerful than twitter spaces and more democratic because 
the chances of you getting on stage and the chance of you getting able, you know, being able to, you know, get yourself out there, promote what, what it is, whatever it is that you're doing and be able to reach the people that are interested in the same things is higher. I would argue than Twitter spaces just because of the facts that, you know, for example, there's a guy I follow, uh, Grant Cardone, right? Mm -hmm. Grant Cardone, I follow him on Clubhouse and I also follow him on Twitter. Okay. Now on Clubhouse, I've actually been invited up on the same stage as Grant Carl uh -huh. able to talk to him directly. You know what I mean? And it, pertaining to whatever that, that room's focus was, right? Yes. And whatever it is that I had a question about or what I was seeking more knowledge about. Now, that same speaker, same guy on Twitter spaces, it feels like he's like a million people away, man. And to even try to get on that stage, like, it, it's just... I had the same exact experience with the geneticist Razib Khan, and I, I read his Substack blog as well. But I was on the same, and I come like converse with him and everything in Clubhouse, but Twitter spaces. It was different. That's so funny that uh, you know it's not scientific study, but you and I had the same kind of uh, distancing experience there. Yeah, man, and that's and but that's that's it, it, there's you're missing out on op Clubhouse has already showed us that you're missing out on opportunities like that, and I'm not just talking about for us on the, you know, the people who are maybe coming up and trying to, you know, gain knowledge or, you know, work with or collaborate, whatever it is that you're trying to do with those people that are maybe a little bit further ahead, mm -hmm. but they're missing opportunities too, because intellect, talent, strategy, all that stuff, it doesn't know hierarchy and they know that, you know, so the short, the shortest answer to your original question was the main major difference between cl how the clubhouse has evolved. I feel like the people that are on there for, you know, looking for exactly whatever they're looking for. Yeah. Those are the guys who are still on there and they're getting a lot of value. They're adding a lot of value and, you know, people are making money on there, which is great. Yeah. So it's like a democratizing force that really allows merit to show forth as opposed to like whatever your pre-existing popularity or whatever reason that you're up there that, that's that's really cool that you took that away from it and then you learned from it to try to apply it in real life just sticking with clubhouse for a sec when you find yourself still logging in like you said recently is it for still spontaneous meetings because i i wonder like personally i wonder to just show my cards if the spontaneity was part of the being like cooped up at home and everybody kind of had you know uh, a similar shared experience of, of the virus and everything but is it still spontaneous meetings that you're just pulling up on or are they like scheduled clubs that you've now kind of developed a few relationships that with with, second one. with interest yeah the second one i would say it's all focused i know exactly where what i'm getting i know exactly where i'm going i might not know exactly what what they're going into the subtopic mm -hmm. but I, I i'm there for the like for example real estate the mortgage syndicate um folks who are doing business pitches and stuff like that. Um, things like that. Business that's, mentors, uh, that coaches, you know, that's good. And you, you know, it, you described what is really a, a kind of a radical audience participation that I also really liked. I remember you came up to me and several other people in the audience and you said like this uh, word of encouragement to just, you know, to mud fed it, to use the title of the, one of the films, uh, of one of the makers there uh, to just be bold and audacious. And it's funny because I'm typically, I, I think one of the more maybe bolder people in, in any given room, but even me, it's like you, you see the format of a panel and it almost comes off as rude, even, even to stand there, even if you're not like interjecting, obviously like interjecting while somebody is speaking is still rude, but even the kind of standing there, you got this kind of shadow or presence over them. And I think especially this Yulinta idea in Habesha culture, like, oh, I'm going to put myself out there. Like my uh, maternal grandfather wrote a, a memoir. And in the intro to the memoir, he said, I know it's not normal for Ethiopians to talk about themselves, but I think it's important to talk about ourselves so that people, you know, down the line could get some glimpse of whatever the historic moment was. And then maybe there's some lesson that they could apply to their life. I wonder uh, from your point of view, um, how did you think people were responding to your, your words of encouragement to get up there? Like what, what, what was the feedback you were getting when you were kind of telling people to just, just get up there, just, just ask a question, just participate. 
You know, here's the thing, bro. Here's the thing, Hanok. I I think that uh, I I try to be as anti Habisha as possible. Uh -huh. I, I'm taking full advantage of this opportunity, which I like to look at as the Habisha American experience, yes. which is still being defined, right? Yes. So I'm gonna I'm going to help shape that definition by being as anti. Habisha, that is my goal, right? You brought it up earlier, right? I, I brought up the disagreement factor. I love, I like mm -hmm. shaking it up. I like shaking things up. I like making people feel uncomfortable. I like putting myself out there. I like being, you know, uh, just like, you know, here's the thing. Our, our, there's, our culture is held back by respectability politics. But there's a lot of things that we need to talk about collectively. And so you're just going to have to get your back up off the wall. You know, uh, part of my thing is like, I don't care about the feedback. The, 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 it's my strength and my weakness. And obviously mm -hmm. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still working things out. I still have some kinks to work out. But uh, by the time I finished saying to get up and go talk, but I was gone to the next group of people before somebody could give me feedback. You know what I mean? <laughs> I love that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I mention him all the time. I don't know if he's your um, spirit animal as well, but Gary Vaynerchuk is my spirit animal of uh, entrepreneurship, okay. uh, Gary V. And one of the things that he always says is this like interesting liminal space that you have to occupy where you're open to hearing any feedback from anybody but you also like couldn't give a f like it's not going to change your mind like you just like you do it so that you can process it but not so that it could sort of manipulate whatever your your point of view is on that a given subject and i it sounds like you're you're saying that and it's something that i i try to abide by too and it's funny to see uh some people not catching that you you brought up actually one of the points of discussions from the panelists and i mm. i would like to hear your thoughts more on that as well is um some of the the panelists were discussing is there a difference uh or is it a difference without a distinction between being habasha and habasha american and the other people were saying we don't have time for that mm. we just got to kind of all be together and and part of it was even a conversation which is i thought interesting about cultural appropriation within mm -hmm. that you know mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. if you're not fob can you play a fob and it, <laughs> what it, what immediately came to my head is i have a family friend she's in a movie shout out if she hears this you hey. a b c d it's on youtube and she's born and raised in ethiopia went to french schools like overwhelming majority of her life nice. she plays in the film a diaspora habisha american Oh, nice. Um, I'm not even sure if she's been here. She might have been here once or twice, but I like the fact that she did that. I was like, go for it. Like, Fire. you know, it, it's not as believable to me just because of like, that's well, you know her. Friend. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> but I yeah. bet you there are people who didn't catch on. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I wonder what you thought of, uh, of, you know, that discussion or any, any extra thoughts you had on, on, uh, and, and you said a little bit of it, uh, by the way, right now. And I think that's, you know, our prerogative to be selective in uh, what parts we identify with and what we don't. Definitely, you know, um, you know, so um, I just I I think that uh, there's a lot of different sides to that. And I'll just make I'll, I'm just going to keep it binary for the sake of time. But I'll just say that, like, our story, the story that we are, uh, the story we're living through right? We're early nineties. I'll pull myself out there. I'm 92. So <laughs> 2010, Shout out. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, but, uh, we're, we're early nineties, uh, East African kids that were raised in the United States. And for some of us, we weren't raised around each other. Some of us don't speak to our language. We all have the, the, the commonality that our parents are from there, but some of us have our own folk. Like we literally have folklore around our own culture because we, we don't have the information or whatever the reason is and wherever, depending on where you grew up, right? Because America, I don't know if you've ever been through a, a road trip through America, but a, each state has its own culture, right? Mm -hmm. So I had gone through the, the country with a partner of mine, an ex-partner, and I, was, I remember being so shocked because my parents were so focused on, hey, go see the world, there's nothing mm -hmm. going on here. But every when I went through the country for the first time as an adult, I was like, man, 
they all have their own subcultures, their own twangs and everything like that. And I think yeah. wherever you come from in America also adds to your story as a Habisha, right? Like Addis, I've yeah. never met an, an a Habisha from Florida, bro. Like I didn't <laughs> even know we were down there, dude. Like, yeah. you know, and I'm from Pennsylvania, right? And like, I was going to ask you about that. Okay. Right? Pennsylvania. Like, from, like Philly yeah. or like, right. I'm not even, I'm not from Philly. I'm from, yeah. I'm from like a, a small town in Pennsylvania, um, about like 30 minutes out of uh, Philly. And there weren't really any Habishas there. You know what I'm saying? We had our, we had our Mahabur, but it was a Mahabur that was made up of uh, folks from New Jersey, folks from Delaware. So we kind of patched it together. Uh, respect, respectfully, there was a community in Philadelphia but that just wasn't our local Mahabir. So, but to, to keep it all on track, I think that we have to honor our own stories and our own life experiences because they are so unique and individual, not to mention the fact that you have a family friend that she has this like third culture, they call third culture kid, right? She went to French school, she's in Ethiopia, she traveled. My cousin, same thing. The, he's you know, born here, born in DC, moved to London, lived there came back, like I have cousins and I'm sure you have cousins in Europe. So they, they all have these kind of like mosaic experiences. And I think that's what we, right. That's what we're trying to refer to. Uh, we're trying to create a new cultural reference. We're creating it. And then we're trying to reference it at the same time. So it gets meta. Right. And then to answer the question about your family friend, I agree with what somebody said on the panel where it's like, yo, we don't have the luxury to pick and choose when it comes to those opportunities in, in terms of representation and work, right? Mm -hmm. I'm so happy that your your friend or your cousin took the role. She deserved it, right? And I'm sure she lit, she lit it up and she killed it. And so I feel the same for for the, uh, there was a woman who who had got up on the mic and said, hey, I'm Eritrean, yes. hey, is cool fight. And I was like, yeah, dude, take it, you know? And the goal is to build out the canon right to build out this canon of habisha work in film and television on the mainstream uh both from the the writing end the directing end the casting end the the in front of the camera the, the acting end so that you do have the luxury at some point of picking and choosing and it will make sense because there's enough going on there to be selective you know but right now we're pioneering we're still in a it's a, it's very it's very much we're at the precipice of of all of it you know so that's my answer no that's w well said and it's the eritrean one is so funny it's such a can of worms i have several eritrean audience members who participate who comment and and i know and we know each other in social media some of them i know in real life as well some just social media and it's like <clears throat> here's the funny thing is like and i say this to them all the time and they know it it's like um for the political divide and separation and all these reasons you can have whatever identity you want but if we're talking about just like blending in like first of all i tell them if i am at a monastery of the eritrean orthodox church me i know what's going on more than over 90 percent of the eritrean population right. that's hands down right. and that's as a deacon in the ethiopian church right uh, and then vice versa if there is an Eritrean who speaks Amharic, unless you tell somebody, they're not going to even know the difference, number one. Oh, absolutely and not. Even if they don't, if they speak Tigrinya, it depends. Uh, there are certain regional dialects and stuff, and somebody can catch you, da 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 But there's, like, plenty of, like, Tigrinya television in Ethiopia, and I, I actually told her uh, some of that as well. So that is, um, no, that's that's good. And that was uh, well said. Um, can you tell me in, in general how you thought the event went and if there were any of the topics you wanted to uh, deep dive, uh, dive deeper on, excuse my French. No, great, uh, it's a great question. Um, I, well, let's just start off with, uh, I really loved your comment, you know. Um, I, I thought it was uh, an important uh, comment um, in regards to, uh, you know, uh, asking Yoel kind of uh, what his intentions and what his plans were for his upcoming uh, project. I think it was a question, it was an elephant in the room that needed to be addressed. And I think that it brought a lot of relief that, uh, first of all, it was, it was also well said. It was very Thank articulate you. and, you know, and, um, and I think that it just opened up the conversation in a, in a, in a 
um, in a and, more honest way. Yeah. yeah, and excuse me just for the audience, that's Prince Yoel, great grandson of uh, Haida Selassie. But yeah, um, yep. I was asking him about prospects of uh, restoration of the Solomonic dynasty and also just perspectives on the Derg, the Marxist-Leninist junta that ruled from 74 to um, 91. And, uh, it, you know, how he felt like wanting to tackle that. And, and then that, yeah, I think it got some of the other panel members talking. Yes. And I thought, I thought that the, the most important things that that comment really opened up and brought out was that, one, we have a lot of juicy topics. And I, I don't mean to say that in a disrespectful way, mm -hmm. but in, in the context of entertainment and in the context of uh, creating, that we have a lot of juicy topics that we need to cover as a community. Yes. Uh, I said the Slomic dynasty, obviously being one of them. Um, you know, we need to talk about the Derg. We need to talk about um, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, right? Uh, we need, to, you know, a lot of people don't know, including myself. I actually recently found this out that the Ark of the Covenant was actually the inspiration behind Indiana Jones yes. and uh, like huge blockbuster series. Mm -hmm. And so for me, as somebody in entertainment, I'm really interested in that magical moment that happens, right? Like how the Ark of the Covenant, this magical thing that is, you know, this historic, this very spiritual, uh, you know, irreverent thing that's happening in Africa can go on to influence a huge, um, you Hollywood. know, Hollywood blockbuster, like, mm -hmm. you know, um, project. And, um, and I think like that is what we need to tap into as creatives, as Habisha creatives is figuring out like, how can we tackle these juicy topics and alchemize them into, uh, you know, work that expands, all of our perspectives inverts them, forces us to ask questions, look in the mirror, talk to each other, and just like the same way we brought up with World War II, you know, yes. we we looked. I, that at was that. my next question. You, you, you know what I mean? Mind. You know what I mean? Because we've looked at that situation from every angle, and so we need to be able to examine ourselves and our own culture and ask ourselves these questions, ask our elders these questions, and I'm excited about the opportunity that we have. As all of us as just speaking from a creative lens. And I thought it was also very important what uh, Leah and Salome also said, Leah from uh, uh, Parkwood Entertainment and Salome from Variety, um, putting putting in that we all, oh, you know, we don't need to one-to-one -one what other communities have done either. We can build our own um, dynamics you know, storytelling dynamics, essentially, and we can have these abstract stories, you know, for, for, for example, my brand, which will eventually move into an animation space, eventually move into a television series, um, is more of like a Habesha Animaniacs. Now, yeah. it, is, it is based, not based, but inspired by Kedus Yared and the larger story of the perseverance uh, that um, Kedus goes on, you know, on his journey of becoming this, you know, great legendary composer of, you know, Tohado gospel and, um, you know, becoming this very big staple of our, of our culture, you know, uh, we do take from that larger story, but, but it, it, it is abstract. It is there to show uh, different points of view and different takes on what Habesha culture and Habesha imagination, actually more important than Habesha culture is Habesha imagination. So um, I think that's really what we're trying to to uh, tap into, and uh, I'm not going to speak for anybody else. I'm just going to say this for myself. I'm not interested in politics. I know that I, I do agree with the statement that everything is inherited, inher inherently political, and I'm opening up a can of worms by even saying that. Okay. But uh, I am I'm more interested in abstract, imaginative um, activity from our community. Yes, I had a, a friend, Salam Darajja, she goes by Salam X, kind of her stage name, I don't know if you know her. She did an abstract movie on actually one of my ancestors. Um, she called it the Prince of Nowhere. And it was uh, Prince Salamayo, he was the son of Emperor Teodros. And he was after the uh, 
you know, suicide of Emperor Teodros, he was taken by the British in their expedition to Britain and he had depression, his mom died. So many horrible things happened and he died in his youth. And I always get on her because I never got to see the movie, but I saw all the like trailers and the marketing and the branding she did, but it was sort of a limited release in major cities. And at the time I was living in North Dakota of all places. So uh, it, it definitely was not screening there. If I was still in LA or in the Bay, I would have, I would have been able to see it. Um, so I, I missed out on that. But um, I, I know her project was very abstract. And one of the actually critiques of uh, telling stories from all these lenses and this conversation that we're having about this mosaic and even the abstraction of the of the Habasha imagination was we were he hearing some of the kind of feedback from the crowd, uh, at least one person was, uh, well, aren't you worried about historicity? So I, I'm uh, on the topic of abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to hear your thoughts on the, and I have my own on the relevance of a sort of objective historicity versus these abstractions and imagination. Well, you know, well, I think that there's definitely a place for both. You know, um, you know, um, history definitely has its place. Uh, Ethiopia uh, um, just happens to have, it be, you know, like any civilization that has been uh, on the earth for a very long time, it, there's it's a long story, right? And with that being said, there's a lot of politics and there's a lot of, um, there's just a history of a lot of uh, feathers being ruffled. Now, yeah. when it comes to, you um, publishing and publication and and in for public information i think that we still have a long way to go and this is an unpopular opinion and i'm i'm totally fine to stand own it and be in front of it and i'll just say this i i you know we have to we have to be able to be honest and look at and ask ourselves who's been in charge of information uh in regarding uh ethiopian history Okay, so I'm sure you're familiar with the phrase history is always told by by those the winner, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, Ethiopia uh, just happens to be a very interesting case study because of the fact that it has this unique position as the only African country to never have been colonized. Depends on who you talk to. It depends on what lens you're looking at it from, right? Just yeah. just because, and this is where history it just gets very tedious because. If you're going to tell the story, you have to at least do your due diligence earnestly to tell as much of the story as possible, which is in, including, is inclusive of various perspectives in order to really get, um, you know, as, as proportionate as possible to the facts, you know? Um, Ethiopia has a, a, a history, uh, it gets meta, right? It has a history about its history being this big folklore, right? The Salomic dynasty is a part of Ethiopian history, but it is not all of Ethiopian history, right? And so I think that we are, we still have to ask ourselves, uh, you know, what it's not selective listening, but it, it's, it's sele selective, being selective about which parts of our story we amplify and uh, how we put that hierarchy of information together, right? And so um, a lot of a lot of the uh, you know edu edu educated uh, groups from Ethiopia have been either related to uh, the power or right. So I think that uh, you know looking at the you know looking at the situation, understanding that we've been uh, what what they call um, a third world, and the reason I use that is to call attention to um the oppression of of the voices that are included in the recording of history when it comes to ethiopia and so i i am hopeful about the possibility that art gives to all of those different voices and this is why i i do champion uh abstraction maybe all, almost to the point of deflection because um i think that we've been conditioned to think that certain people from certain places that have certain stories don't matter. And we have a lot of unlearning to do still. A lot of our parents carry that um, belief. I know 
growing up on the East Coast, like, you know, there's still a lot of that mentality that was carried over from uh, just Jan Hoy's time. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't mean that you're an enemy of Jan Hoy if you don't think like that. And that's okay. The, I, I, I hope to see a day that one day we release that paranoia, you know, and, and I know where it comes from, the trauma that they went through from the Derg and, yeah. and, and all of this collective, this compounded trauma that makes us feel scared and disempowered to share different perspectives or have different opinions on things. And um, yeah. That's the long. That's the longest answer. I I would love to see more people take advantage of the fact that they're not in Ethiopia and in Eritrea mm -hmm. and tell as many stories as possible. If they're interested in in being historically accurate, go write books. Please write them in English for yeah. all. Because there's a lot of Ethiopian. Talk to Ethiopians and Eritreans. I'm sure you talked to a lot of people, right? Podcasts, right? Yeah. A lot of people don't know the history. They know they know bits and pieces, the selective histories. But they don't know the the whole history. Now you're different though, because you have tapped in in a lot of different areas. You know, specifically with the church, who also has a very long history of recording the country's history, right? That's right. So it, it's um, almost all the literate people are church people. Even when you look at forget the ancient days, the 20th century. What's the greatest book in uh, Amharic literature? Took it a Abar that Teddy Afro plays off of in his song and says like mm -hmm. um, Love to the Grave, right? Is this famous book by Addi Salamayo. How did Addi Salamayo become uh, a writer? He learned Gu'uz poetry at a monastery. Wow, wow. Uh, Gitacho Haile just passed away about a year or two ago. He was the most famous Gu'uz scholar in the world in terms of like Western university. We have of course indigenous scholars. Mm. Um, same thing with him. He, he learned in the traditional school. Uh, there was this guy, Tadassa Tamrat. He was a professor of history. He wrote this great book, Church and State, which I've talked about on my channel before. He was actually my dad's professor of history at Haile Selassie University. His dad, same thing. His dad, uh, all these guys, by the way, their dads were like priests. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then their dads basically considered them illiterate if they didn't study Gu'uz poetry first. They're like, if you don't know Gu'uz poetry, you're illiterate. Like, I don't, care, I don't care what degree you have. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's because it's a, it's the Latin, right? It's the foundation of, of mm -hmm. you know, where our language starts. And, and um, yeah, I mean, and I, I you know, I don't want to give off the impression that I, I uh, don't have uh, a reverence or respect or, um, you know, um, because I do. And I embrace every, I embrace every part of our culture that's brought us to this point. You obviously do if you're inspired by St. Yadid. Nobody oh, is inspired by St. Yadid <laughs> who hate that would be weird if you hated St. Yadid yeah. and were inspired. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My grandpa was uh, was also in the church. I never met him, but my grandpa was also in the church. Um, wow. My dad's father. So yeah. So that's what I was gonna ask you is being situated in kind of um not let's say major city but Pennsylvania, East Coast culture, uh, which by the way, you don't have like any sort of like noticeable accent. east coast accent yeah yeah like you 100 percent west coast passing <laughs> let's do it man i'm down 100 100 percent i thought you grew up in the valley with me and the Kanesh and, <laughs> yeah. and Meron, if you know her the three of us worked on uh, habisha la since back in 2014 trying to gather habisha uh creatives and collectives together we did our first event back in 2010 um uh, that year that you shouted out uh, earlier uh, oh no no excuse me it was 2014 it was right. a 2014 but i was there in 2010 as well the wow. 2014 soccer tournament in san jose was our very first kind of gathering we got maclit music we had uh, really a, yeah 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 you guys were we had, there i, I yeah. was there too That's oh you were there. that was our event in san jose up in the uh close to oakland right and all yes. that and yeah, bro. It's called the Prophet. He's a, a Havisha rapper. And oh we wow! A, a I know Burnface. Burnface was there. Yeah, yeah, that's Ajax. that's my dude, man. That's, yeah, he was <laughs> there. He was there. We got him there. Yeah. Um. That's yeah. That was me. That was Dinkanesh. That was Ida Salomon, if you know her. Yeah, yeah, she's I know Ida. Program. Oh. Uh, she's been on the program too. Yeah, she was her baby, but we all worked uh, together on that um, project. So we we've been in this like gathering Habisha creatives for a minute, but I'm. I'm curious. Hats off to you guys. Hats off. Thank you. You Thank walked you. so we could run, man. Seriously. <laughs> keep, keep, keep it yeah. up. And we're still um, doing it. Absolutely. I want to come back to Hollywood, but just on the East Coast piece um, and this kind of 
access to the the background of Ethiopia that then lets you kind of play with it in whatever direction you want. Um, it sounds like from what you're saying, you you may or may not have had direct access to that media in Amharic. How was kind of Habesha culture mediated to you? Did your did your parents do? Because I'll tell you, for example, my pops did not really explain a lot. I kind of learned stuff on the go, but I'd have certain aunties that were talkative, and I would listen. How mm -hmm. how how was the Habesha culture mediated to you, or the knowledge of it? Definitely. Okay, so definitely. Um... So my, you know, my mom is very big on history. My mom is uh, very big on history. You know, my grandfather on that side was very big on history. He respectively played a part in history and government, you know, during Haile Selassie's time. Um, uh, on that side of my family, a lot of them were very interested in keeping the, the history alive. Mm -hmm. um, I, I spoke with a, a, a number of relatives, including his brother, who also participated in, in Haile Selassie's government, um, uh, actually, the last conversation we spoke, we spoke at length before he passed in 2013. And I've always just had an interest. Uh, my grandfather, he died in 2003. And uh, just being like his funeral alone, how many people came out and how many people spoke about him and all these things and he lived in new york right he had just survived uh the twin towers crashing wow and wow. then uh two because he lived a couple blocks from there and then yeah. two years later he ended up dying and just seeing like like you said like being from P pa grew up around a bunch of you know upper class white mo predominantly jewish uh peers and um not really seeing there wasn't a lot of black people let alone ethiopian people and uh, then having this like stark, you know, going to his funeral, seeing all these people. He had two funerals here in Ethiopia. And I just so became just so, what, what did he do? What, what did he do? What was his role? What were they doing? What were their larger goals? Who are these people? What is this? You know, where did this come from? Da, 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 da. Then I've always been an artist and I've always, been obviously as you can see you know my ears are kind of stretched i have tattoos on my head i've got whatever going on and um i identify as queer and so i've always i've always been um not 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 exactly what the what you ordered right and mm -hmm. because of that uh you know having that interest in the history and, and where all those things come from being an artist and being an, a black sheep i think just take you to a point where you want to deconstruct everything just to rebuild it again. And I think when you, you learn the animal before you kill it and skin it, <laughs> right? so and, put it back, and put it back together. <laughs> right. So I think that's kind of what I was doing. And that's really what, um, because I love, I love being Habisha, but the there's things about being Habisha that I don't like that I learned later had nothing to do with being Habisha. And it was just, small-minded people you know yeah. and so why do we have to take that out on the culture if anything why can't we add more to the culture why can't we add more breathing room to the culture you know yeah that's it's interesting that you said there was i didn't know there was a jewish community in pa like that i had heard about <laughs> kind of one synagogue um you know killing horrible incident but I, I didn't know it was a big thing. I know about LA, LA is huge. I know New York, and I thought DC was the lesser version of LA and New York. Mm. Is there anything with, I don't know if you grew up going to, I, I did, uh, any bar mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs, uh, or if you know their and looked at their community building at all, is there anything, because it's actually an example that I list all the time, especially mm. in terms of like keeping money within that economy. Is there anything in terms of Jewish community building that, that has ever influenced you? Of course. I mean, you just hit it right on the nail, right? Like, uh, not only was bar and bat mitzvahs rite of passage for the the you know Jewish young Jewish boys and girls at the age of thirteen, but it was rite of passage in my community to know that you were like legitimate in in the social circles, right? Because everybody was Jewish. So with the the weekend after the bar and bat mitzvah, everybody would come in with the clothes, and you would know who was invited and who wasn't. You know, so it was a huge deal. It was a, it was a really big thing. And like you said, um, the community building aspect, right? Like that's a, an ethic that that community holds. 
as a principle and a value, and they do a very great job of, of expressing that and exemplifying that, um, being true to that. And I think that that's something that we have in common with them as Havishas in the in the ways that we have, uh, you know, like Mahabur and um, a different little, uh, not little, but different community organizations, um, less formal, um, you know, that we utilize to sustain our culture and um, to provide support for each other. Um, as far as the keeping the Habesha dollar circulating, um, that's definitely a, a big goal of ours. I think uh, just circling back to the event, that was one of the, the main points that we wanted, right? We wanted to use the, this event as an activation and an opportunity to network on the spot and create more opportunities, right? So I think it was really effective in that way, keeping in mind those community organizing tactics that uh, were impressed upon me subconsciously growing up um, around this very tight-knit, successful community. You know, absolutely. I I noticed even like, you know, you could have had like random drinks, but you had like even touch. You know what I mean? Like on brand, we have the Ethiopian honey <laughs> wine. You know what I mean? So I have always said it's crazy to me that there are no, there's no like touch bit. You know, like where's right. the where's like the spot where you can just get touch and Allah? Like um, right. I always call it on you know moon, moonshine beer on tap. Like <laughs> why is that not? Why is that not a thing? There are barely a few companies that kind of locally sell even bottled edge. It's almost like every batch is some Scots Irish moonshine from the prohibition <laughs> period. And, and you know what I mean? It's no. <laughs> someone comparing it. Yeah. Like, no, so you're I gonna you're gonna see that. a lot more of that. You're gonna see a you're gonna see a I'm telling you, uh Henoch, this generation uh between millennials and uh Gen Z, you're going to see a massive jump. In the way that we approach our community going forward, um, and I, I spoke spoken to D about that. I mean, you've already seen this now, and I'm sure, I'm hoping that for the people that were able to come to the event, for the people that were able to tune into the event, and for the people that were just able maybe to see the flyer on the internet, that this inspires somebody in Michigan, this inspires somebody in D.C., this inspires somebody in Minnesota, in Kansas, wherever we have community, to go out and 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 take different approaches to uh, you know gathering the people around you and creating value and creating opportunities um, and creating platforms for yourselves and each other. You know. Yes, I for me, and as you've mentioned and I've mentioned. The church is the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawadu Church is the kind of main medium through which I have access to the community in LA and all over the place. But I noticed as I kind of like leveled up in the church that I almost missed out on this other super diverse aspect of the community. Like my dad grew up, uh, you know, he's Orthodox Christian culturally, not not like really big into the faith, but um he, like all his neighbors were muslim adres you know from harar and so he grew up like doing ramadan with them you know what i mean and he grew up um even speaking their language in addition to amharic and still speaks a little bit of it to this day even though it's not like his ethnic group's language like it's just you know it's a, the medium of communication those were his neighbors and it was that kind of environment that i was raised around in in la and i i feel like this type of event that you had kind of re-brings access to people who are just there for that that big moment and it leads me to my next question for you is like coming from pa and, and then coming to hollywood right and then creating this hollywood is is habisha first as the provocateur but then like you instantiated it you made it you gave it flesh and bones and spirit um what what is it that you think of of hollywood because i get a lot of out-of-town people telling me it's like oh everybody in la is fake or this or that and the third even if they're like from here and, and like Addis and moved and came back certain people have i think certain critiques of the people that meet here but you must have enjoyed the community because you're continuing to create it like you didn't get disheartened and go back yet <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll see it's still out no i'm playing <laughs> i had nothing to go back to 
No, but um, uh, okay. So I'll just put it to you like this, uh, Hanak. You know, I, you know, I came out when I was 25 years old. I didn't have a plan. I didn't know very many people. I had relatives. I had maybe one relative that I knew of at that time, um, and uh, 2017. And they, that that family was out in in, uh, in Orange County, and um, and at that time I lived in Los Feliz, and so. I ended up meeting Dinkinish um, through my brand, through the art page, That's dope. and yeah, which was which was really dope. And um, I never knew that somebody like Dinkinish ever existed, and I never met anybody like Dinkinish in terms of a, a, a Habisha a person that was like my age with this style and this boldness. And I know they might not self-describe themselves that way, but that's how I perceived them and uh was outwardly uh queer and just just living their life and doing cool things and being habisha and i invited them to meet with me at an event that i was run uh i was working in the uh in the art uh art world here in los angeles um a matter of fact i'll plug it right now it was a, a gallery called blum and poe so you check it out if you're in los angeles really great gallery and basically dinganish and i met and immediately felt the connection and was like, you know what, let's do something together. Within a week, Dinkinish wow. and I, without even knowing each other, put on an event and uh, we've just been working together ever since. And was that the first iteration of this one or something else? That was something else. That was a 2591 anniversary event. And uh, St. Yared, me and her, we, we did it together and I, we just called, I sponsored it. And, um, uh, you know that went really well and from that event i de i wasn't at the event but uh from that event i you know brought somebody else that was habisha that i had met it, working with us and then i brought another habisha girl that i had just met at a cafe working with us so all of a sudden it was the wow. four of us we didn't know each other all we knew is that we were habisha and they liked my art and i liked them and i liked what they were doing and we just we started working together from there addis came to that event knew knew about my brand reached out then I went to a New Africa event, introduced myself. We, you know, started working together from there, and and um, they have really been, you know, everything. I don't know. They've been everything for me. You know, Dinkinish, uh, uh, Andis. Um, you know, from from those relationships, I met Ida Solomon, uh, uh, Melat, and um, I, I guess what I'll say is the relationships from day one have always been about the work mm -hmm. and about the work has always been about the community so we already had that common ground um as far as the reputation that los angeles has from a from an outsider perspective <laughs> you know you the same could be argued about the east coast the only thing is People are a little uglier and the weather is a little shittier. <laughs> 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 I mean, like, uh, you know, East Coast is very like, don't waste my time. What do you want? You know, very direct, very straightforward. And um, I'm, you know, bringing that heat from, you know, bringing that attitude to the West Coast. I don't really care. I don't really care if you, first of all, you can ask the people I mentioned. I don't go outside. You you will never see me. You won't see me at the bar. You won't see me at the club. You won't see me like you might see me at church, but it won't be the Habisha church. I go to a different church um, just because I don't speak Amharic. But I, I I you will only see me at functions where I'm working. Typically, That's beautiful. Yeah. So. I don't really care. I mean, you're being fake to me for what? I'm just be direct. If you want to work together, let's talk about it and see if things line up and let's collaborate. You just, you know, people, I think sometimes people forget that you, you're allowed to be direct, you know? Um, and, and then the other part of it is let the work speak for itself, you know, before you go and collaborate with anybody or meet with people, it's usually, you know, you check and see, you know, the work should speak for itself, you know? So. That's right. No, it's um, I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. And I think I've mentioned before on this program that sometimes people get caught up in analysis paralysis. I've, I've seen it with close friends and 
they have this kind of idea, but if it's not perfect, they're not going to put it out there. And I've been a big person of just leaning into the imperfection and just putting it out there and not expecting immediate gratification. And it's, you know, it's like, I'd started this podcast. I had a Bible study one before in 2017 and 16, but I started this one in, um, so I was not new to the podcasting space, but I started this one mid June, just had lost my job because of the pandemic. And I was like, I got time. I got time. I think I did like 50 episodes that first summer. I was a savage in the beginning and then I slowed down. Um, but I still, I've stayed consistent in the production of it. So it's, I'm glad to hear you say that you put your head down and you're doing the work and then you let that work itself uh reflect and it's up to people to either accept or reject that message that you're you're putting out into the world um as, as we're winding down here i would love for you to plug absolutely everywhere you are so people could get a hold of that message more frequently um uh, if they accept or reject it you know uh on their own and if you have any sort of um parting thoughts words of encouragement for uh more people to just start playing i like the word tinker i'm a tinkerer uh, so for people to start tinkering more and and playing more in whatever they're you know they're passionate about yeah definitely um i would say the best way to to kind of follow along with the the things that i'm working on and uh collaborating on are going to be uh through the art page on instagram which is saint yared so it's just going to be at Saint dot Jared, uh, Jared with a Y, and then um, the other uh, organization, Hollywood is Habisha. You can find us at on Instagram at Hollywood is Habisha, um, all one word, no underscores, no dots. Um, and then um, I just want to say thank you again, Henok. I think what you're doing is amazing. I think it's really, really important uh, that we continue to have um, spaces and opportunities to document. Um, all of the uh, people that are making kind of like the hobby shot culture in LA right now and uh, going forward I think your work is really really important to our collective archive so thank you and um, I would just say that you know be the change that you want to see like if there's something and I know that you can probably think of a million things that could be better in our community and um, for our people and to create more opportunities for yourself and your cousins or friends or people that you know. Um, try, try anything and everything. There's no such thing as failure unless you quit. So that's that's all I have to say. <laughs> Amen. I'm a second. I'm a second.